Thank you very much to our speaker, Samuel Churavero, joining us today from DTU over in Copenhagen. Uh, so Samuel studied the Masters in Acoustics at DTU, uh, which is run by uh, Efren Bernadis Grandes, who you can also see is on the call there. Um, so they run a kind of, I can safely say this to you because because you're all he's signed up and locked into our MSC in Acoustics, uh, but they also run a fantastic MSC in Acoustics. And Samuel has gone on from that and, and done a PhD. Um, it's really interesting areas. So, um, so Efren's area, if he doesn't mind me saying, is kind of like looking at microphone arrays and kind of sparse and compressed sensing for microphone arrays, so sort of post-processing to get more out of a microphone array than the sort of spatial Fourier limit of sampling would suggest you could. Uh, Samuel's been looking at those sort of things as well. Um, I've sat through an interesting talk from him at the ICA in Arken on, um, oh, there's someone from, uh, the, 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 the chair of the uh, European Acoustic Association Young Acousticians Network, which has joined us, um, which is nice. And um, I hope you. So, and I've sat through an interesting talk with him at, at, at Arken, looking at kind of different, what we would call sort of dictionaries for interpolating special fields in rooms. So this is kind of, what this is kind of coming around to is, can you predict the sound field in all of a room from some measurements from sparse points? And then what we're, I think, also talking about today is uh, acousto-optic sensing, so using optics like lasers and things to actually sense the, the change in pressure and then build up the field in the sound from that. And uh, there was some, also some really interesting parallel work done at the National Physics Laboratory in the UK on this sort of area. Um, but if I'm getting this correct, Samuel's kind of taken some of those same ideas and combined it with some of his compressed sensing to build full room reconstruction. So really, really interesting stuff. So over to you, Samuel. I'm going to mute myself so I don't interfere. Uh, Great. So okay. thanks a lot, uh, Jim, for the for the presentation, and also thank you for inviting me to participate in the seminar. Um, so as the title suggests, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, reconstruction of acoustic fields and uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, optical sensing methods uh, in order to achieve so. So a bit of background uh, on myself. Uh, I am currently a postdoc at the Acoustic Technology Group uh, at the Technical University of Denmark, uh, which is a few kilometers north of Copenhagen. You can see it there in the map. Uh, and here in the group, uh, well, we are some of the some of the members of the group here. Here in the group, uh, we do fundamental research on acoustics, uh, vibration, room acoustics, uh, numerical acoustics, and some others. And as you said, we also have a, a master's program on uh, engineering acoustics. So during the last three and a half years, I have been working towards my PhD, uh, which is titled Spatial Sensing and Reconstruction of Acoustic Fields which is part of a larger project, which is called the Large Scale Acoustic Holography Project, which is led by a friend, Fernandez Grande, uh, whom also supervised my uh, PhD. And my research interests include uh, optical sensing methods, spatial analysis of sound fields, uh, sparse signal processing, compressive sensing, as you said, and uh, in general, inverse problems in acoustics. Uh, as I said before, I'm part of a larger team, which is the Large Scale Acoustic Holography, and uh, these are the phases of such team. So uh, the goal uh, that I had uh, was, or what we wanted to achieve, is to sample and reconstruct sound fields over space so that we get a full characterization of a three-dimensional sound field over an extended region of space. Uh, for example, a room or other enclosures. So the spatial information of sound fields is actually central to many applications in acoustics and audio research. Um, however, it is actually quite challenging to obtain, and this is partly due to the large number of measurements that we that we require or that is required. Um, and uh, actually, the number of measurements will scale with the cube of the frequency if we are measuring on a volume and the frequency squared if what we are measuring is on a plane. So a quick calculation can show that if we were to sample a sound field in a, in a volume, if we do that uniformly, um, 
uh, in a volume of say 1.1 times 1 times 1 meters uh, up to say uh, 3 kilohertz, then we would need in the order of hundreds or maybe, maybe even a few thousand uh, measurements. So during my PhD, I have been researching several techniques that we, we can do to alleviate those issues. Uh, and uh, one of them is sparse representation techniques, uh, also known as compressive sensing. Uh, I also looked into the optimization of the positions of sensors, uh, but what I'm going to talk about uh, today mostly is on optical sensing methods. So if we want to uh, sample the sound field on a volume, uh, the first thing we can do is uh, we take a microphone array. And while microphone arrays are actually very good at providing directional information of sound fields, uh, they do not scale well uh, with size. So if we would like to measure a large volume, uh, then we would need many, many uh, measurements or many, many microphones. Uh, especially if we want to measure at mid-high frequencies, uh, this large number of microphones are going to introduce some scattering and diffraction effects in the measure sound field, which is not going to be negligible, not going to be negligible, and um, and in the end, we yeah, it, it will introduce some bias in our measurements. Uh, of course, uh, calibrating hundreds of transducers is also not a trivial task. So an alternative is using sequential measurements. And in this case, what we do is we have one or several microphones that we position uh, somewhere in, in this space. Then uh, we measure the impulse response, for example, and then we move them to the next position and we measure again and so on. So if we look at the literature, there are many different systems and, um, and uh, all of them uh, require an extra complexity uh, step, which is the design and programming of this automatic system that will measure or that will move our microphones in the space. Uh, also, depending on the speed at which the measurements are relocated and the area that we want to cover, uh, this can be slower than using a just a simple microphone array. Uh, there are other solutions, such as uh, sensor networks and so on, but I won't uh, go into that. Um, so what I have been uh, researching is optical measurements as an alternative to, uh, to microphone arrays and sequential measurements. And optical measurements are based on the acousto-optic interaction. And the acousto-optic interaction uh, basically describes the different effects that light experiences as it travels through an acoustic field. So light, uh, for example, it gets diffracted by ultrasound. It also uh, uh, beams of light get uh, deflected uh, when they uh, travel through an acoustic field, for example, is, is what we are showing here in this figure. If this disturbance is an acoustic field, then uh, the um, light uh, beams are going to be deflected. And also there is going to be some retardation effect. So light is going to travel faster or slower depending on the acoustic field. So one of the big advantages of this method is that it's non-invasive. So unlike microphones, uh, here the sensing element is light, which does not introduce any diffraction or any uh, scattering on the mesh or sound field. Also, we can steer uh, light beams very precisely, which um, allows us to achieve very high spatial resolution. And this is particularly, re particularly relevant when we want to measure at high frequencies. Uh, you can imagine that if we want to measure at high frequencies, then we will need many, many uh, microphones, which will introduce uh, some disturbance in our sound field. Uh, but uh, using uh, optical measurements, we won't reduce the number of measurements, but uh, we, those are uh, non-invasive, so then uh, we can add as many as, as we want. Uh, we will be measuring with optical interferometers like this one, and also those measurements can be uh, automated by using, a, for example, a scanning, uh, a scanning uh, interferometer. Okay, so a bit on uh, historical background of the acoustic interaction. Uh, 
The first uh, optical methods to visualize waves can be traced back to the 19th century, uh, where the Schlieren technique um, was uh, invented and developed, and it was used for visualizing shock waves. Uh, this same technology was used by Sabine already in 1915 uh, to visualize shock waves inside uh, uh, scale models uh, that he used for his uh, uh, research in architectural acoustics. Uh, but it was in 19, 1922 when the diffraction uh, of light induced by acoustic waves was first theoretically predicted and it was uh, experimentally observed for the first time 10 years later. And during the following decade, there was uh, the theoretical foundations of this uh, were actually laid by uh, Raman and Nath. Uh, but it wasn't until the 1960s when we start to see uh, many, many applications of the acoustic interaction. And that is because laser technology started to become more and more available. So it is important to remark here that um, the great majority of the applications of the acoustic interaction deal with the modification of the properties of light by using sound waves. Um, but in the 90s, early 2000s, we start to see that uh, studies in which they use light uh, in order to characterize sound fields, which is what's important for us here. This was first done for underwater and ultrasound acoustics, and more recently it's been extended to air and audible frequency range. Here I have listed some of the uh, recent literature, but there are many others. Um, and the thing is that in most of these studies, uh, the measurement conditions are very well controlled. They are in a, in a laboratory and they require a very specific measurement configuration. And what we said to do was to, or what we asked ourselves if it's possible to take uh, this um, technology or these uh, acoustic measurements uh, outside of the lab and then uh, apply them into um, the reconstruction of volumetric uh, acoustic fields. Uh, so the acoustic interaction uh, that is interesting for us in this presentation uh, can be described with this simple equation uh, where we have the index of refraction of air, uh, which is just the ratio between the speed of light in vacuum or the speed of light in air. And that is expressed as the sum of two terms. The first term, term is the index of refraction under static conditions, meaning we don't have when we don't have a, a pressure field. And the second term is the product of the PSO optic coefficient, which is going to indicate as the variation that we are going to have in the refractive index due to pressure waves. Uh, and for air is in the order of 10 to the power of minus 9. Um, and of course, we have the acoustic pressure P. I'm not going to describe how we can arrive to this equation, but it's actually quite simple to derive. Uh, we just need to take into account that the um, propagation of sound in air is nearly an adiabatic phenomenon. Also, we need to know the relation between the density of a gas and its refractive index, and we are also required to make a first order approximation as we normally do in linear acoustics. Uh, so what's important for us uh, in this equation is to observe that changes in pressure P are, is going to or are going to induce changes in the speed of light. And those changes are actually going to be very small, at least in air, since the PSO optic coefficient is very small and the uh, refractive index is going to be about one. So basically we have this scheme here where we have a pressure field and then we have a light beam marked in red. And uh, the areas in which the pressure is low are going to be areas in which the speed of sound is going to be slightly higher. And the areas in which the pressure is high, then the speed of sound is going to be slightly slower. Um, so these acoustic uh, fluctuations, uh, pressure fluctuations, are going to translate into phase shifts uh, of this light wave. So if now consider that uh, this a beam is a wave that propagates in this direction, then the phase of that wave is going to be uh, 
conditioned by the acoustic pressure of the medium. And uh, we can measure those phase shifts uh, using optical interferometers. So I will go quickly through an, or an example of an optical interferometer. Uh, we can generate some laser light that has some phase, omega times L, and that uh, beam is divided into a sensing beam and a reference beam. Then the reference beam is uh, modulated with some frequency, and then the sensing beam is sent to the pressure field. So the pressure field here is uh, represented with this gray area, uh, so it's this PR, P of R, uh, and then the sensing beam is going to travel through it, then it's going to be reflected at the boundary of the domain, and then it's going to be yeah, reflected back towards the interferometer, where it's going to uh, be directed in the same direction as the uh, reference beam. So if we look at the phase of the reference beam, that's going to be uh, the initial phase times the phase that we introduce with the modulator, and then a phase that depends on the path that it follows. Then if we look at the sensing beam, the phase is going to be, again, the, um, the initial phase, and then a phase term that depends on the pressure field, and that's what's, what's important for us. Now these two beams uh, interfere in a detector which generates an intensity which then we demodulate and we obtain a signal P. And this signal B is just uh, or can be expressed as uh, the time derivative of the sum of these two terms. So the first term here, LS, it just denotes the length of the sensing beam. And then the second term is something that is proportional to the integral of the pressure field along the laser beam. So imagine that we don't have any pressure, like pressure is zero, so then what we would be measuring is the time derivative of the length of the sensing beam, which basically is the velocity of the boundary at that point. And this is actually what laser Doppler vibrometers use when uh, we measure the vibration velocity of some object. Now, uh, let's assume that this uh, boundary is rigid, so there is no velocity here. So the first term is going to be zero. Uh, and then what we are measuring is the second term. So what we are measuring is actually proportional to the integral of the pressure along the laser beam. And it is important to remark that then this method is not going to provide us the pressure at the specific positions like microphones do, but is actually going to provide uh, line integrals of the pressure field. Uh, this line integral integral measurements can also be called projection measurements, and it is the very same thing as uh, for uh, X-ray tomography. So say, for example, in medical imaging that we want to um, investigate uh, the inside of a body, then we generate an X-ray, we make it uh, pass through the body, and then we uh, have a detector on the other side. And the intensity of the light that, or of the X-ray that we detect um, is going to be proportional to the density of the body. Therefore, we need some sort of reconstruction or tomographic reconstruction uh, method that allows us to then visualize what's the inside of, of this body that we are studying. And the same thing happens when uh, with, our, with our pressure field. We have the same kind of uh, integral measurements. Um, there are, yeah, we need reconstruction techniques. There are many, uh, many different uh, types of uh, tomographic reconstruction techniques, um, but the one that is uh, used uh, or that is most used is uh, called filter back projection. It's the classical reconstruction technique, which is uh, based on an explicit Fourier transform. Uh, this method normally requires a very large number of measurements and it also requires a very specific measurement configuration. So we cannot place the measurements the way we want. Um, so what, actually what we are proposing, uh, or what we proposed in, in this study that I'm uh, referencing here, um, is the use or we proposed in a, a reconstruction method uh, that sets the problem in an algebraic fashion and it also expands the sound field uh, using um, elementary waves. 
so this is what I'm showing here. This is the proposed, uh, proposed uh, approach. So basically, we are expanding the pressure field uh, in a sum, using a sum of n plane waves that have certain amplitude, complex amplitude, a n, and then there is a phase term that depends on the direction of the wave and then positions along the laser beam. And then we can express our measurements as the sum of uh, these complex, uh, uh, complex amplitudes, and then we have the integral of the propagation term. So the good things about this method that we are proposing is that first of all, it's flexible. Now we don't need to use any uh, specific measurement configuration. We can place our uh, laser beams more or less the way we want. Um, it requires many, many less measurements uh, when compared to filter back projection, which remember is the classical reconstruction uh, uh, algorithm. And uh, since we are using plane waves, uh, we can estimate not only the acoustic pressure, but also the particle velocity, uh, density fields, and the radiated power. So I have here a numerical experiment in which I simulated a monopole radiating a free field uh, at the frequency of 2.5 kilohertz in an area of one times one meters. And then I, uh, I simulated the pressure at a, with a very fine spatial resolution so I have 260 times 260 points in which I simulate the pressure. Now we have, or I'm going to use two sampling conditions. One that I name full sampling, in which we have as many measurements as we have uh, points in this uh, simulation. And then one that I call decimated sampling, in which we only have samples in the center of this domain. So if we take a look at the results that we obtain when we use uh, the classical filter back projection, uh, when we have uh, enough measurements, then the reconstruction is quite okay. However, when we reduce the number of measurements and then we only take measurements in the center, this is the only area which is actually properly reconstructed and then we have uh, pretty large artifacts uh, elsewhere. Then if we look at the results that we obtain from the proposed method, uh, we see that when we have a lot of measurements, then uh, the reconstruction is almost perfect, but we get a pretty good reconstruction as well when we reduce the number of measurements. And this is uh, because we are using uh, elementary waves in order to express the sound field. So in a way, we are introducing the knowledge that uh, what we are measuring is not a random object, but is actually um, a sound field, and therefore it is expressed well by using uh, elementary uh, waves, such as plane waves. Okay, I also did some experiments uh, in free field. Uh, so in this case, this is not a simulation, it's actually measurements that we did in the anechoic chamber here at DTU. So in this case, uh, I used a scanning interferometer that uh, I'm showing here, and I'm directed, directing a laser beam at 102 positions along this pole. So I'm fixing some steel pole here, which is going to act as the boundary of my domain. And then I am uh, uh, measuring or I'm scanning this plane at uh, using 102 uh, laser beams. I'm reconstructing the sound uh, pressure in an area of 1.6 times 1.6 meters that I'm indicating here in this figure. And I'm going to compare the results with the simulation of a monopole radiating a free field. And this is not uh, the true reference because uh, there might be some uh, effects that uh, are occurring here that are not well represented with just a simple ideal monopole. Uh, for example, the radiation pattern of the last figure is not captured. But still, it's going to be a good visual aid that is uh, going to gives us an idea if the reconstruction is actually plausible or not. So we have here the reconstructed pressure. Uh, this is the, yeah, in the top is the measured and reconstructed. And then in the bottom, we have the one calculated for the monopole. We can see that the reconstructed pressure is quite plausible. Um, there is a, 
uh, especially in terms of phase, and there is some deviations in terms of amplitude. We can also, as I said before, uh, recover what the particle velocity is, and we can draw similar conclusions. Um, and we can also calculate what the uh, intensity is. Uh, and we can see that uh, the directional um, features of the, of the intensity field are actually well recovered if you compare uh, the vectors uh, in this figure and in this figure. So there are, however, some uh, differences in amplitude, especially towards the corners of the domain. And that is actually caused by the fact that we are measuring only from a single angle. So we are restricting the measurement, measurements as much as we can here. Uh, I did some simulations, which I'm not showing here, but I, I did some simulations in which we have, or I'm including also measurements from different directions, and the amplitude uh, matches uh, better. So the, the reconstruction is more accurate. Okay. Um, and as I said before, the idea was to try to take uh, optical measurements outside of the lab and then apply it maybe for reconstructing the sound field uh, inside the volume of a room. So we went to one of the rooms here at DTU. Uh, it has a reverberation time of about one second. Uh, and then we are using again this kind of interferometer. But in this case, instead of measuring in, on one plane, we are measuring inside this uh, pyramid volume. And I'm using 814 measurements. Um, I'm reconstructing the uh, pressure inside this uh, volume that I'm showing here with the dashed line of one meter times 0.5 times 0.5. And I'm reconstructing between 1.5 and 3 kilohertz. I am also measuring the sound pressure in 27 positions randomly placed on this volume so that I have a reference to compare uh, my, my, my uh, reconstruction. So I prepared a small movie, that, uh, like a little video that I can show. I hope that uh, you can see it. And uh, before I press play, I will just quickly explain what we are seeing here. So we are seeing the time domain reconstruction. So in the top, we have uh, the pressure, time domain pressure at uh, three of the surfaces of the reconstructed uh, volume. Um, and they are plotted as a, um, as a color map. Uh, on the left side, we have the reconstruction and on the right side, we have a simulation. I did a simulation with the image source method for the sound field in that specific room. Then in the bottom, uh, we have uh, the impulse response at a specific location that is indicated here with this white dot. Um, yeah, uh, both for the reconstruction and the simulation. So if I press play, we can see what we see first is the direct sound that is arriving from the loudspeaker. So it's traveling in the uh, negative x direction. And, um, and now I'm going to stop again now, and we are going to see a reflection that comes from a wall that is at x equals zero. And also we are going to see a reflection that is going to come from uh, an oblique direction here from the floor. Now it's also quite interesting to see the interference pattern that appears between these two reflections, and then they continue. I can uh, now uh, put the video from the beginning uh, without stopping, so you can compare both the uh, reconstruction and the simulation. Okay, so I think um, what's quite remarkable here is uh, I will just share this again. What is quite remarkable here is that we are indeed able to um, uh, measure and reconstruct the sound field on the volume of a room from uh, purely optical measurements. Uh, we can also look at this more in a quantitative way um, by comparing the impulse response that we reconstruct 
with the one that we measured uh, with the microphone in one of those 27 positions. Um, so in the top we have uh, both the impact response measured with the microphone and the one reconstructed from optical measurements. And we see that they align quite well, like all the reflections arrive at the same time uh, for the two of them. Now if we look at the, at the simulation, uh, we see that uh, there is probably some simplifying assumptions in the image source method that make uh, the simulation not align as well uh, in terms of the time of arrival of the different reflections. Uh, this is for a different uh, position of this 27 and we see that uh, we can uh, draw similar conclusions. Um, we can also extend this method uh, to take into account the near field. And this is an ongoing work, so it's still not, uh, not published yet, uh, but we are working on, on this paper together with uh, Eric Williams. So the idea here is that uh, we want to extend this uh, method to take into account evanescent waves so that we can apply the principles of near field acoustic holography to optical measurements. So in this case, we are measure measuring a plate uh, that is excited and um, we are also using a turntable to rotate the plate and then obtain measurements from several directions. So in this case, it's not a single direction as we had before, but we are actually taking measurements all around the plate. Um, we are measuring uh, above this plate uh, with a distance of 3.5 centimeters, which is enough to capture some of the evanescent waves uh, that are present in the sample. Um, and the, num the total number of measurements is going, or is, it is uh, 962, uh, if we count all the, all the beams from all the directions. Um, these are uh, preliminary results that we have. Uh, this is the reconstruction on the plate. So we measure it above uh, the plate uh, with a distance of 3.5 centimeters, but now we are reconstructing on the plane. Uh, and this is for one resonance frequency of such, uh, such plate. And we can see that we are indeed able to recover the, the mode of vibration. And uh, yeah, the, as I said before, we can calculate the, the pressure, particle velocity, and active and reactive intensity fields. And this is uh, the reconstruction that we obtain for a single position uh, is above the plate and then we are plotting the sound pressure level, uh, both reconstructed and measured with the microphone. And we see that we obtain a, a pretty quick results. So, uh, conclusions. Um, I have been talking about an acoustic sensing as an alternative to conventional microphone arrays and sequential measurements in order to characterize acoustic fields over space. We said that uh, one of the biggest advantages of this method is that it's non-invasive and also for that reason is particularly good at high frequencies. Um, I have been uh, proposing a elementary wave expansion uh, or a method based on an elementary wave expansion which allows for the use of arbitrary measurements so we are not restricted to this uh, to this type of measurements as we had with, um, with filter back projection. Uh, this method also reduces largely the number of uh, measurements that we require when compared to this classical tomography. So we do, not, we do not reduce the number of measurements compared to microphone arrays, but we do uh, with compared to um, filter back projection, for example. Um, and it allows also for the reconstruction of pressure, particle velocity, and intensity fields as well. So, and as an overall conclusion, uh, what I wanted with this presentation is maybe inspire you, and also what I want with this work is to uh, hopefully advance and extend the use of optical sensing methods uh, for some field reconstruction. Uh, acknowledgements, of course, to my supervisor, a friend, uh, also to Salvador uh, Barrera Figueroa. For, 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 lending us, uh, our, for lending us the scanning uh, laser Doppler vibrometer and to Eric Williams for our collaboration on the near field measurements.
So thank you for listening and please uh, ask any question you might have. And I have put here two of the references. Uh, the second one is about compressive sensing, so it's not that much about um, uh, optical methods, but uh, it could also be interesting for some of you. And yeah, uh, please contact me if you, if you uh, I don't know, would like to uh, discuss anything. Right, thank you very much. Fantastic, some really, really interesting stuff there. I've got plenty of questions that probably no one else wants to hear. Uh, but we'll start with anyone else's questions that, that they might have. So if you're in the room, you can wave your arm in the air, or if you're not in the room, you can wave your virtual hand in the air and, uh, and we'll, we'll figure this out.